Chris. How are you doing today? Hey, Dave. I'm doing good. Hey, we've got some really interesting things to do here today. I'm going to do uh, a little demonstration on uh, repairing a rotor shaft uh, that goes in a T62 gas turbine engine. This is a compressor housing off of a T6232. And this would be how you would remove, this is what the rotor assembly looks like once we have it uh, removed from the engine. And let me get this nut off here and we'll talk about that in a second. <clears throat> this actually fits down inside there and it lifts right out and then this, this nut, there's a bearing that goes on the shaft here and this is what they call an oil slinger nut. It take and, and it actually extracts oil. It actually goes on this way, and the oil shoots up through the middle of the shaft, and the air from some of the compressor bleed comes out through some holes on the back here, and it blows it back around the shaft and through the bearing and back into the gearbox. I got a I've got a shaft that's removed, and we can demonstrate that better in a minute. Uh, but this is how it looks coming out of the engine. In order to work on this, we'll take and remove the hot wheel. Uh, and the seal plate uh, from the compressor and the shaft and I'll show you over here with another assembly how that actually goes. Okay, this is a, a rotor that's been dismantled from a different type of engine. Uh, well actually it's probably the same type of engine but th these, these are very common components that are shared amongst different engines but this is kind of what you get to see here as the uh, this one's this one's a new assembly here. Uh, the hot wheel actually goes on here behind the seal plate uh, well, this is this is one that came out of a burned up engine and was still running as a matter of fact but this actually goes on here and this is pressed together and it's got three points that this can go together in you got three different positions it can fit in uh, you get that gets in uh, we put it in a press over there and then we take and we press it together and then we put a bolt in here uh, and it's it's a special bolt and we tighten that up and torque it to the right values when we go to put the engine together we take this, so when it's all cleaned and ready to go, we do a couple measurements on the shaft. First, a lot of these shafts have some inconsistency in here. This is where the rear ball bearing is. So what we do is we I like to see these at a certain number because they fit the bearing the best. And when you get these, they can range. This one happens to be 66. Six, 89 to 6690. Uh, and we measure these in tenths. This is probably the preferred range right here. When we get to 6691 and 6692, they fit very hard in the bearing. And if you have to take it apart again, it's really tough to get them apart uh, without damaging more stuff. On the the bearing, that the high speed roller bearing, this is a this is a shafted with everything stripped off it. And this area here you'll see the little wear area. That's where the roller bearing runs. This is harder than the rest of the shaft. And this is at a Rockwell 68 to 72, Rockwell C scale, which is pretty hard. These run from 7733 uh, to 7737. Uh, we, we, and we, we get bearings that are made in different sizes. So we have a couple of tenths clearance all the way around the shaft with the bearing. This uh, to put the, we don't take the, uh, the compressor wheel off of these unless we absolutely have to to replace the wheel because these are put in liquid nitrogen and then we heat the wheel to about 550 and it has to be pressed and you can always des destroy or damage the wheel and the shaft uh, when you start to take it apart. And these oil slinger nuts are taken off the shaft when you're disassembling it. And if you look inside here there's a very heavy stake mark you'll see a and what it does is it's designed to lock this on and not be able to become off at all, practically. And what happens is when the manufacturer designed these rotor assemblies, they were designed to be thrown away if there was a problem. In today's market, we can't get parts for these, so we try to salvage everything we can to repair these engines. I make new nuts uh, because once these are damaged from trying to take apart, and you can see the thread damage at the end here, you can't put a new nut on it. You can't do anything with it. So if I can't repair that shaft assembly, 
then the whole the whole rotor shaft assembly minus the wheel if we can get it off is not usable anymore and we don't want to we don't want to do that this one actually only had a couple hours on it so it's almost new um, a lot of people out there are machinists but we want to make sure that the uh, the cutter is perfectly perpendicular to the shaft and then we use a right standard 60 degree cutter we set it up with the half nuts locked and we run the machine uh, we don't stop the machine and reset it. Uh, we basically will just run it out, I'll back it off, and we'll run it in again at another depth. Now I'm going to demonstrate this one. We're at about there. This will just advance forward and it would show it's not actually cutting anything right now, it's perfectly lined. And we'll stop it before it gets to the end. Back this off. Run in reverse. One, one very important step in this is to make sure all the slack is up out of the drivetrain before you engage it again in, into the actual thread. So you see I'm a little bit further back, right about there. We want to run this in a little bit further. And as you get down towards the end, uh, we're only engaging this at a half thousandths or a thousandths at a time. So I'm going to continue. This is a tedious and time consuming process. But what this will usually end up doing is when you get down into the good threads that haven't been damaged yet, you'll end up uh, just shaving a slight amount off of the thread that's already there. Uh, as we can see, the stake in this, this one here went down into the shaft and it forced that cone in the shaft. So I couldn't get good centering. If you look at this side, you'll see the threads are all damaged. This nut is totally not usable. So what we do is we take and uh, make a new nut here. I make all these replacements because you can't get these anywhere. This is kind of an improved one. We've been making them out of 18.8 stainless and uh, 4350 shafting material. We've even tried some with 303 stainless. They're all fully CNC machined. Uh, they're probably better than the originals. Uh, we actually made these grooves a little bit deeper. Not much. We kept the spacing the same so we have the same clearance, but it'll actually draw a little bit more air and oil through uh, the shaft to ensure a little bit better lubrication. Also trying to be careful because we don't want to pull too much through too fast as the uh, nozzle in the uh, planetary is only capable of supplying so much oil. So this will fit right on. And it spins nice and free. Here we are back again. This little spacer fits onto the shaft pretty much like this. And your bearing, which is mounted in the compressor housing, fits on there. When this is put back together with the hot wheel and seal plate and everything in it, this nut goes all the way down and locks against the inner race on that bearing. And the outer race is kind of light press into the housing and it has a it has a deflector plate and a bracket that holds that in very solid on the outer part of the race so that bearing can't turn at all. Common problem with these engines is that rear bearing fails. And I happen to have one right here. Uh, it's the old style bearing that was installed in many of these engines. Uh, and the cage fails. There are small rivets that kind of hold the plastic together. This engine uh, was very fortunate to survive because once this comes apart and the bearings start going around in there, it usually destroys the whole power head. Uh, the new bearings are all one piece cage. They're made out of a silicon bronze, uh, very good high quality bearing. These these were designed back in the 60s uh, and, and you know they didn't have the bearing technology back then that we have today. This is a shaft with everything removed. The, ro the ball bearing fits basically on here. The roller bearing fits on this section here, uh, and as you can see, this hole here, there's three holes in the shaft, and it allows your compressor wheel is is pressed on here, and it's held in place with three screws through here, and three pins, so you, it isn't going anywhere. These channels, these channels that are cut into the shaft here, allow compressor bleed air to come through in here. And, and allow it to be forced back down through the shaft and through the bearings, through both the roller bearing. This is the high-speed roller bearing that goes inside there. Uh, this is the one that everybody gets concerned about, controls the up and down play. 
it does flow freely on the shaft and it runs, it runs right in this area right here and this is what's spinning at 60,000 RPM the oil comes out of those holes it goes between the cage and the back here and it goes right over the rollers and it's drawn back through here on the outside your ball bearing would be here would be pulled through that and the oil slinger nut when it's all in place and grab the wrong one what it does is the oil comes in and it hits the back here and as this is spinning it's like a fan blade it's throwing it all out in a different direction and and I'll show on the, on the compressor housing in a minute how that actually works uh, but this all is critical measurement. This is like Rockwell 768 to 72 in here. It's hard and it's got about a 5 micro inch finish. It has to be precision. The shafts actually come in different sizes. This one is marks .7732. So we'd want probably a bearing that was properly gauged to fit this shaft correctly. You can't always see that and you can't always measure it so you have to guess sometimes. But most of the bearings are only made in 4 tenths total. Uh, size variant so that you've got one tenth increment in each one. Each of the manufacturer marked the bearings when they made them. And this is probably 8620 steel or 9310. I'm pretty sure it's more likely 8620. It's a very rugged piece of steel. The shafts are balanced individually before they start populating with the compressor wheel and the, and the, and the uh, hot wheel. And we're going to do another video probably pretty soon on how we, how we balance these and, make, and go through the, that whole process. The seal plate uh, fits between the compressor and the hot wheel. It has a floating hot shield here which is made out of a Hastelway material. It reflects probably 15, 1600 degrees temperature that's coming off of this wheel. Uh, so when we put this all together, uh, this all fits down inside. I'm not actually going to put it down because this one hasn't been cleaned yet. But the seal plate will fit right in here. Now when the compressor, uh, which is right here, draws air in through the compressor housing, it makes a 90 degree turn off of the, off of the impingement tips and it blows it through the diffuser. This, this is a removable piece made out of aluminum. That air comes up through the compressor housing into the combustion housing and it's redirected back down into the burner can assembly where it's burned and it's and that's through the hot gas nozzle and it's, it's burned right off of these tips. That, the, the, it's a gas at that point and not a flame. Now what you would see off the back would be this part. That oil slinger nut is on, a, there's a plate that screws on there that retains the bearing in there. Uh, the oil slinger nut will throw oil all against here and it'll drain back into the into the main gearbox. This actually fits down inside. This is the drive shaft and it's splined down inside there. A spe special uh, made spline that screws into the shaft when it's made. And this shaft is locked in place by a lock ring. This actually comes over here. This is a gearbox that's got a planetary in it. This this pinion shaft right here is all made to fit right down inside here. So that's that's the driving mechanism. And we convert 60,000 RPM here to a 10.1 to 1 reduction so we get 6,000 RPM out. And that's what everybody uses is a 6,000 RPM output. You can see that the, the that the precision required to hold this thing together and run at that RPM is quite a quite an achievement for back in the 1960s. The shaft, and, and actually the gears are relatively not hard. Uh, the shaft is, is a good high quality shaft. Uh, very seldom have problems with it. Occasionally you have bearings and axle shafts that fail in the planetary, but on the whole the, the gearbox is quite rugged. Just want to cover a few more things. Uh, we just quickly showed this wheel. This, this engine was severely over temped and it actually melted all the vanes right off it. The engine was still running uh, I'm amazed uh, that it didn't do more damage. You can see the cracks on the back. This, this wheel was ready to disintegrate and come through the side of the engine. So you want to be really careful uh, when you run these things hard. Uh, if, if you over-temp them, they'll take a little bit. They're fairly res resilient engine, 
The first thing that will go is the seal plate will warp the heat shield on it, and that'll be a first indication. Most of the time, these will grind to a halt. This one was pretty much pretty badly abused. Uh, I keep it here to show people just how bad it was, and you got to consider too. This is a Inconel or Hastelloy derivative. It's a very, it's a very rugged, tough, heat-resistant material, and you have to keep that temperature away from this shaft and all the oil, which is probably 250 or 300 degrees by the time it gets into here, maybe less. So you've got to do a lot of designing in these things to get the heat away from that. If you look at the rotor shaft, you can see they even cut a groove around the outside edge. And the, and the real contact area is just this inner area right here. So they minimize the contact area with the wheel, and you can see where it actually sits right here. So that you get minimum surface convection from a very hot surface to one that you want to keep very cool. It's, a, it's kind of a neat design. Yeah, and I gotta say I'm impressed with how, how reliable and how long lasting these engines are. They're they're a great engine. The uh the newer engines use titanium. Uh the shafts are still made the same way. Uh it, it's still the same design. You can this is a better uh better picture here because the uh this one hasn't really been run yet. And you can see it's it's mostly pressed together and held with screws and once this thing is all sandwiched together it, it, it kind of stays together it should never come apart